Thanks uh, for coming, everybody. How many people heard my talk earlier? Oh, good. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what the format of this uh, session ought to be. It's uh, been called sep separate things. I sort of like Q&A, though. So since all of you were here, I don't think you need any more introductory remarks from me. Why don't we just get with it and hear from you about your comments? Uh, yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. I really enjoyed it. I um, enjoy your, your judgment. I mean, it's really <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, I'm about to do a research study. I'm applying the scientific method to a hypothesis that I've come up with over the last 20 years of clinical research. And what I've found is that our memories, rather than being stored in our brain, or perhaps in addition to being stored in our brain, appear to be stored in standing waves in the magnetic field around our body. And I'm able to use a single tuning fork, like a needle on an album, and go slowly through this field. The tuning fork will broadcast the information that's in those waves, and I can decipher them. And so I can go through somebody and I can read their whole life history. They had a head injury when they are five. They've got this going on in their body, that sort of thing. So if we can actually show that this is so, that our memories are outside of our body in this field, I think it has the potential to demonstrate that consciousness exists outside the body. But the standard model is very adamant about how consciousness is in the brain, even though there's no real evidence of that. And it seems to me that it's more sort of political than anything else, this adherence to this belief that, because it makes people depressed, and when people are depressed, they buy antidepressants, anxiety, all that sort of thing. So let's just say that this study shows this, and we submit it to journals and it gets published. How can that have any impact where the presiding belief seems to be more dogma and um, uh, brainwashing you know, than anything else. Yeah. Well, I think you may have stumbled onto uh, what in consciousness research has been known for a long time, by which I mean at least 30 or 40 years as the sheep-goat effect. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, known that people who actually believe that this sort of thing is possible that telepathy, clairvoyance, and uh, precognition are real, score better on double-blind tests than people who don't. That's one of the most solid outcomes of consciousness research in the past few decades. That undoubtedly would be a possible con confound in your, your, your study. There are other possibilities. Uh, among which we call the experimenter effect. You no doubt believe that this is possible or you probably wouldn't be doing the study. Uh, it would be important for you to build into your study uh, a method where you s screen out the possibility that they, the subjects were not picking up your beliefs. You could actually, you could, I think, no doubt skew the outcome of the experiment if you don't do that. There's also the issue of uh, whether or not thought transference is at all electromagnetic. And there's a lot of evidence to say that it may not be. For example, I mentioned non-local transferences of stuff in my talk. There are three criteria to be met in order for something to be called a non-local transfer or correlation of a distant with a proximal event, the correlations have to be immediate. There can be no time delay, in other words, from one to another. That doesn't sound like electromagnetic in essence. Electromagnetism signals are a time-requiring sort of thing. Uh, it has to be, these non-local correlations need to be unmediated. People have looked for some sort of signal transfer and haven't been able to find one. And they are said to be unmitigated, which is to say the farther away these two uh, subjects are, that doesn't diminish the strength of the correlation. I, this may be totally confusing, but you have bitten off a hugely <laughs> complicated thing to study. Yes. And I, I think beforehand, it's really important to try to come to terms with these confounds because if you 
submit the paper to a peer review journal that knows what they're doing, they're going to come back with these, uh, these issues to you. Uh, still, I think you really ought to do the study. Well, I've hired a team of researchers. The organization, she, is going to do it for me. So I'll let them worry about all those details that the peer review yeah. people will come up with. But um, I also do this work at a distance. So, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand how and why it works at a distance. And I've trained hundreds of people to do it as well. So, you know, it just seems to me that there's mountains and mountains of evidence out there about this non-locality, about how, you know, all of this, and yet there's really no, there's very little evidence or no evidence of consciousness just being local to the brain. And, you know, if this is supposed to be science, shouldn't we be looking at all of the evidence instead of attaching to the dogma? Yes, well, before I uh, became, became affiliated 20 years ago with a uh, consciousness research-oriented journal, I couldn't get my own experiments published. Uh, I mean, trying to publish in a conventional scientific journal with studies like you just described is not the best way to advance your career. Uh, I found that out. I uh, am now executive editor of a journal called, called Explore, the Journal of Consciousness and Healing. And if you're looking for a journal to submit your study to, keep us in mind. I will. Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, first, I would say again, you were one of the most fascinating uh, presenters so far, and I think it's going to be over soon, so <laughs> you might hold that torch. Um, let's say we're living in a perfect world where everybody agrees that consciousness exists. We study about it in uh, universities. What near-death experiences can teach us about consciousness? Near-death experiences can teach us about consciousness. You said that you have folders and folders about that subject. So. Uh, I think the first place to go is to read about some of these whoppers that people come back with. Uh, they're certainly not hard to find. There are lots of books. If any of you all read Eben Alexander's uh, book, Proof of Heaven? Yes. If any of you want are looking to bite off this... Uh, field of study to jump into. I would recommend that. Dr. Alexander uh, was a Harvard-trained neurosurgeon who was one of the most materialistically oriented products of uh, American medical education he, you will ever find. He explicitly believed nothing about what I talked about this morning. And the fact that he had almost died from what uh, was uh, something called E. coli meningitis, which is absolutely rare. Uh, it is notable, but he came back with one of the most fantastic stories I've ever heard of. Actually, it's been said in many ways uh, before, but the fact that he was a materialistic, Harvard-trained neurosurgeon put a gloss on this that the other stories just don't have. And so, I, I think the, the thing that we get out of NDEs is simply the fact that uh, there are no materialistic explanations for what those people understand. They come back with information that cannot be acquired by the senses ordinarily. This has even occurred in blind people who have no business seeing what's beyond that wall, but they acquire information that's not supposed to be possible for people who are congenitally blind. Uh, this is a, an important aspect of this whole genre. The other thing that impresses me is that the people who are following, coming back, their lives are utterly transformed. They have a new sense of connectedness with everything there is. They're practically fearless of future death. And, uh, their whole sense of morals and ethics tend to undergo a life-changing transformation. That's why some of these people really have a hard time adjusting to life when they, they come back. Uh, I think that for those people, that experience is all they need to affirm that consciousness is non-local. That is to say, it's infinite in time and space, and it persists <coughs> in situations where the brain just simply doesn't function. So uh, that's the main pattern I, I gleaned from these things. 
I don't care whether, as Oprah asked me one time, well, Larry, do they wear clothes over there? I don't think that's where the action is. I mean, I, I think it's whether or not there's any solid evidence that something survives. And I give a, a solid answer to that. But it's not based upon the one category of evidence. NDEs, near-death experiences, is only one category out of about six which ought to be looked at because they point in the same way. And if you have different approaches in science that point in the same direction, that really counts for something. It's not that you can come up with people's stories and experiences that tell you something, but if you compare experiences with experiments, boy, you've got something then. That's where the situation is now. And uh, if you want to conceive of this uh, war of the materialist against the spiritualist, we're going to win the war. <laughs> Actually, I don't say that out of any malice, but the fact is that the data is on our side. And it's becoming more abundant instead of uh, less. Hello, Dr. Dossi. Um, the this community, which I have fallen in love with, you know, the survival of consciousness, um, even at something as open-minded as this conference, that they don't straddle that fence of a personality surviving. And so it's just more the um, universal consciousness, which seems very floaty, you know, sort of what's the purpose of it. You know, these, um, and so with um, Ian Stevenson's um, things, and also with a lot of other evidence, that it seems that a personality could survive. Why is that such a hard thing for even people here at SAM to talk about? It's kind of you know this sort of hidden little secret. Yeah, well, I, I can't speak for people at SAM. I, uh, I am well aware of the controversy. Uh, you know, there's a tendency in some spiritual traditions to uh, detach from personality and ego. So. That's not exactly the sorts of thing that some people would want to see survive. I must say, however, if you take uh, experiences such as Dr. Evan Alexander's near-death experience, there's a strong sense that personality and self-identity is maintained over there. Different people can be recognized. He recognized his sister whom he didn't know in this life. So there are all sorts of uh, uh, reasons to think that personality is not is not extinguished. I meet the same objections that you've just voiced. I uh, I have uh, individuals to express to me the fact that they don't like this one mind deal. You know, all the boundaries disappear and they're swallowed up in some sort of homogeneous goo. And so they're not sure they're keen on this this not local unbounded stuff i i think that it's both ways i mean i i think the evidence points to the fact that there are two sides to the coin uh, i think it's a so-called complementary phenomenon where we have a sense of preserved personhood as well as a sense of connectedness with all there is i just don't see the the point and, and forcing this into one corner or another. Uh, you know, that's just me. Well, some people describe it in a different way. They'd like to be a pomegranate and have all the seeds inside. It's a real part of the pomegranate. Yeah. You know, so. I have some interesting experience with uh, fundamentalist Christians in this business who really get their backs up about this business of being one with all there is. You know, Jesus died for me. Me, right? So don't give me any of this non-local unitary connectedness stuff. Then what do you do about the Trinity? You know, I, I don't choose to get involved in if there's any way out of theological arguments because they tend not to go anywhere. But uh, I just think people need to follow their own inner light. I ain't selling. You know, this is just the way it seems to me. 
But I think the overall picture of the reports that come back from NDEers is that it is both. There's a strong sense of unity and oneness with everything, and personality is preserved as part of that. And if that doesn't make sense, well, there's a lot of things in modern science that defy common sense, such as quantum mechanics. Um, hello, Doctor. I, I know this is a conference about non-duality and not wanting to separate people or make judgments, but I can't help but listening to you and looking at the slides and all the quotes of what you said was conventional science versus the more poetic or other scientists that are uh, looking at this, the one. It almost seems to break down to some kind of a typology, that there are certain types of people that, for this, they just can't accept it, or whether it's through fear or just the way that they're wired versus the more open. And I know that it, you can't, I can't say that without judgment, but in, in your experience, are there just people that are wired where they're not going to get this no matter what you say to them? Uh, I don't think it uh, <coughs> breaks down in terms of whether they're wired. Uh, I, I think there are any number of reasons why some people really found it, in, some scientists really found it tough to follow the line of thinking I expressed earlier today. Uh, there, are real, there, there are careers built upon certain points of view, and uh, standing up for non-local consciousness is not a recognized way of advancing your career or getting a promotion or tenure, you may find that you're not approved for the next grant you apply for if your colleagues think that you are into this non-local consciousness uh, domain. Uh, that's just a fact. Here's another fact. There was a, an anonymous survey about 30 years ago, it hasn't changed since then, but it's been repeated, that asked scientists, academic scientists involved in colleges and universities, whether they think ESP has been proven or is likely to be proven. Over half of these scientists, when they had the opportunity to do the survey anonymously, said they were convinced that it was a fact or was likely to be proven in the future. When you extended that survey out of uh, hardcore scientists to professors in the humanities, uh, the figure went up to 80%. It is not true that most scientists don't believe in any of this stuff. It's a public, it's, uh, it's a public, re it's a reputation sort of thing. And uh, so that's what the survey showed. And if you want to uh, actually, these surveys have looked at what doctors believe about remote healing, which interests me. The, far, by far, the uh, majority of actually hands-on doctors who spend their time in the trenches dealing with sick people uh, are convinced that uh, spiritual healing is real and that people's healing intentions can affect the biological course of a sick person who may not even be aware that they're being prayed for or intended to heal or that sort of thing. I follow these surveys pretty closely, and uh, so th th that's that's what the picture looks like from the pers perspective of uh, clinical practice. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm very interested in active communication and actually have facilitated people in that. Yeah. Don't leave the mic. Well, communications. Uh, but I have one question. Yep. Um, it's it's pretty labor intensive to for me to get people into that expanded state to feel like the communication is really happening, and some people go there very quickly. So I've been very curious about brain tones, bineural tones in the brain that can facilitate that degree into a state that facilitates that. Do you have anybody working on that right now that I can talk to? Well, I don't know very much about that field. I have some friends in the consciousness research area who are absolutely fascinated by that area. One is Dr. Irvin Laszlo, L-A-S-Z-L-O, who 
really is keen on this. Uh, he and I and Gene Houston co-authored a book that's just out called What is Consciousness? And Dr. Laszlo's contribution to that has to do with exactly with what you're talking about. But you just sort of went <coughs> beyond my pay grade. I, uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know very much about that field myself. So is L-A-S-Z-O? L-A-S-Z-L-O. Thank you. Yeah, he's, uh, he's an amazing guy. He's, uh, I think, Hungarian or Austrian by birth, Eastern European in any, in any case. He was a concert pianist who stormed Europe as a child playing the piano. He's uh, prolific. He's written only about, uh, I've lost count, I think it's 90 books on that. But he's worth your time. We have a question over here. Yes, Hi, Larry. I just want to say, first and foremost, I've followed your work for years, and it was just a pleasure to hear you speak today. Really, really nice. And I look forward to reading your book. The question that I have is, my background is Native American, Mi'kmaq Indian. My grandfather would be known as a shaman today. And so what intrigues me with your work is, for us, what we do to ourselves, we do to Mother Earth, we do to all. So my responsibility is to take care of me, because it is, in essence, taking care of you. So, so an analogy I would give to that is if you look at the coral reefs today around the world, how they're breaking down, well, one of the predominant, whether you want to call it a disease, or I know there's a lot of inquiry about that, but with addiction, it's breaking down of the liver. See the similarity there? And so do you do any research or do you touch into the Native American, I'll call it wisdom? Well, I, I've lived in Santa Fe for 30 years and uh, in northern New Mexico, there's a Native American shaman behind every rock. And I've had a major opportunity to hang out with shamans. And I've had them journey for me. Uh, I've, uh, when I wrote a book on the role of prayer and the compassion and the intentionality of healing, uh, I interviewed quite a number of them. That was an interesting experience. They told me, uh, what are you fooling around this prayer stuff for? We don't even have a word for prayer. And uh, it was like, you know, it's we live in a constant state of positive regard for other human beings. We don't dress it up with anything formal like you white people do. Uh, and I found that very instructive. So yes, I honor uh, Native American perspectives a great deal of my work and I see this relevance of uh, connectivity far beyond person to person to involve person and earth. I think that is the most crucial issue in consciousness research these days. And without that I think we're going to continue to screw things up. And I think this understanding of unity, not just between people, but between us in all sense of life, is going to be absolutely crucial if we're going to uh, confront the challenges that, that we face. So I think Native Americans have a hell of a lot to teach us along those lines. Any more Native Americans here? We have time for one more question. Thank you very much. Uh, I found your um, presentation this morning very interesting. And what I, what I really liked about it, and I, I come from a background of working, I worked for the United Nations for many years in conflict zones. And what struck me in your presentation is that you repeatedly refer to issues of the golden rule, values, ethics. And at the end of the day, science is there to reinforce the consciousness or evidence it. But at the end of the day, it is the golden rule put into practice. It's, it's not the intellectualization around it, but the, the practical behavior towards our fellow human beings that is the outcome of that. So that's why I found your presentation so inspirational, because you, you, you brought it back to reality, to the day-to-day -day reality of our humanity. Um, so I have two questions. One is because I would like to share that with my children, because I encourage their creativity, and that is to explore a little bit more around the universal mind and how, how we access the creativity because, or how the creativity, the creative process, because it can, it can be triggered in so many ways, even through just a walk in the park. 
or listening to beautiful piece of music. So that's one side. And the other one, um, so the creative process, and the other one is your repeated references to values and ethics and the golden rule uh, in the context of our consciousness and the universal mind. Thank you. You know, I, I have an entire lecture devoted to the <coughs> connection between non-local consciousness and creativity. There are a couple, several books that speak to this that have influenced me. If any of you are interested, interested there's a book called Fire in the Crucible, Fire in the Crucible by John Briggs, who's a humanitarian scholar, uh, and uh, Arthur Keswick's book, The Act of Creation, is one of the best books ever written on creativity. Both of these authors follow uh, this idea that there is a transcendent source of information which can be tapped under certain conditions. Uh, and uh, I think this uh, is a possible explanation for a phenomenon that we desperately, desperately need an explanation for. I didn't mention one of these examples this morning because I didn't have time. It's the question of how you understand savants. Rain Man was the movie that went into this. Most of these uh, people are mentally retarded with very low IQ. Most of them cannot even read. How in the world they become so <coughs> incredibly gifted? Uh, there's no explanation of that in terms of what the brain is doing. There's some desperate attempts are made, but they don't work. And so I've been uh, really fascinated uh, by the possibility that if we're going to do well on this earth, we need to do a better job of finding how, how, how best to access that, that kind of information. You can make a long list of great artists. Uh, Mondrian was an example. And musicians. Mahler was a fantastic example. Who had no idea how they gained the information that they put down on paper. I think that our ability to do well in the end on, the, in, on this earth will also involve our ability to be created in ways that we have denied possible. Uh, I don't know how to enlarge on the issue of ethics and morality other than what I said this morning. But I think that uh, conventional science and neurophysiology is feeding into our lack of ability to find good answers for the problems that, is, that we that we confront, and uh, you know, I mentioned Kessler's metaphor of unplugging the keyhole this morning, removing the stuffing from the keyhole. I don't know what your favorite way of doing <laughs> of doing that is. God knows, people have tried everything in the history of the human race, from music to drugs, and everything in between. One of my favorite ways is just exposing myself to beauty. Whether it's uh, spending hours in an art museum or listening to exalted music. For 30 years, my wife and I have, uh, the, uh, have devoted a month, up to a month, in raw wilderness. We camp out at 12,000 feet somewhere in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, such as the Wind the River Wilderness area in Wyoming, alone. You can get your mind altered in a, in a month in the wilderness, which is you and the bears. And I find that that's uh, been one of the most uh, helpful prods toward creativity that I've ever experienced. I'm not selling it. Most people are horrified by it. But uh, I'm sure that didn't even get close to your question. But, uh, mm -hmm. What do you do at the UN? Well, I, um, I, I, I worked for the UN in um, Afghanistan, Sudan, uh, during the Bosnian War, uh, the Middle East, for the past 25 years, and in New York as well. And um, ever since I was a child and decided to join the UN, I, I felt that needed to bring consciousness and spirituality into that everyday life of 
politics, bureaucracies, and organizations. And I, I wrote a book actually, The Case for Humanity at 2.30 today. What was the name of it? Pardon? The name of your book? The Case for Humanity. Um, uh, where I where I used about my experience over the past 25 years, yes, to bring out that um, humanity is a part of our spiritual journey, and as a matter of fact, perhaps also uh, an end station. Humanity and divinity is pretty much the same, two sides of the same coin. Because if we cannot be humane, then everything else doesn't really matter. Um, so yes, yeah, so I learned a lot from people suffering severe traumas in armed conflicts. Um, in wars, um, they teach you a lot about humanity and with that also the inner divinity and the universal mind. I would love to read your book. I will do. Uh, so I think it's very oh, important. Oh, you should. Yeah. yeah. And I think we need, I think time has come, you know, looking at elections and so forth and the rhetoric, I think time has come. Even inside the United Nations and all bureaucracies, we need to merge into spirituality. Well, I can report some good news to you. And from medical education circles that might, might perk you up a little bit. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, far more than 50% of the enrolling classes in medical schools these days are made up by women. And I can just simply tell you that women don't struggle with these ideas of spirituality and healing to the extent that us guys do. It, it's just a fact. And in my travels and speaking to medical schools, there's just been a sea change in openness toward the role of compassion and empathy and, and spirituality and healing. Thanks, ladies. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a hopeful, hopeful sign. Well, thank you, Dr. Dossi. Um,